Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to the Science Technology Society channel on the New Books Network. I'm your host, Francis, and I have with me today Professor Stefan Lauren Sordner, author of the new book, We Have Always Been Cyborgs. Welcome to the podcast, Stefan. Many thanks for that kind introduction. <laughs> um, so I thought we could start off talking about the name of the book, because it's a really it's a really fascinating name to me. Why did you choose this as the name of your book? We have always been cyborgs. What What is a cyborg? Well, the cyborg actually sort of when it goes, when you talk about the cyborg etymologically, cyborg comes from Kubernetes, which is an ancient Greek term, and it means helmsman, the steers person of a ship. So a cyborg means a steered orc, a steered orc, orc meaning organism, a steered organism. And so by by means of that title, I was able to capture two elements which I'm trying to present. One, which is sort of a way of of taking on some as elements of critical posthumanism, Donna Haraway, Catherine Hales, and so on. And another element is is what I'm, some elements of transhumanism, which I'm trying to present. Sort of on the one hand, it's about, about talking about the ethics of enhancement. On the other hand, it's talking about a revised anthropology. And I'm embracing both elements. And I actually think sort of even though very often critical posthumanism and transhumanism are seen as hostile um, towards each other, I think they're actually much more closely related than what they both recognize. And uh, we've always beat cyborgs. So the cyborg is a steered organism. And steering begins when, when we learn language sort of right after birth, we don't speak any language. What happens then is sort of our parents come up to us, our environment, and they upgrade us. They, they teach us, they make us learn language. And then we, then we uh, go to school and, and we study mathematics and physics and history. And then these are further upgrading procedures. So traditionally, in the entire Western tradition, language learning had to do with possessing a rational soul. And, and the explanation for why we, we stand out among all the other entities in the world is that because we do have a rational soul. So language is not an acquisition. Language was not seen as an upgrade. Language was seen as something which we received from God. According to the Catholic Church, that happened directly during fertilization, when the rational soul is something immaterial, gets connected to our material body, the fertilized egg. And so by stressing that we've always been cyborgs, I'm, I'm presenting that has been implausible, become implausible after, after Darwin, that basically that something immaterial sort of gets connected to something material, but rather that it's, it's a dynamic process. We, we've acquired language. This is how we, this is how we, we, we become speaking rational beings. But rationality as a consequence, obviously, is not such a unified rationality as we used to believe in. Um, however, it is something because each rationality is different, because each of our cultural, all of our cultural circumstances, all of our upgrading processes have been different. That's why there's a slight difference. It's not a unified eternal immaterial rationality, but rationality has come, is, is an embodied rationality, it has come come about as part of educational procedures, and it permanently it gets altered by means of further technologies, by means of uh, other applications, also like gene technologies, digitalization, brain-computer interfaces. And this is sort of the way to connect, on the one hand, a revised anthropology, a revised understanding of ourselves, but on the other hand, I can also talk about, and that has enormous implications also concerning how the ethics of, of emerging technologies, how we should deal with all the great challenges like uh, CRISPR-Cas9, gene editing, and, and brain-computer interfaces with which we are currently confronted. So is rationality itself a technology? Exactly. Um, and, and this is the important thing. So rationality being a technology that also has implications that it's a technology shouldn't just be seen as a means. It's not a functional understanding of rationality or of language. So, of course, one aspect of, you know, why have a hammer is, you know, it's, it's got a sp specific 
purpose. But on the other hand, it also alters who we are and our being in the world. So by means of rationality, by means of having having language, I'm able to communicate. If I sort of leave, go out of uh, John Cabot University, go into the next coffee bar and then order a coffee, then I manage to get a coffee. I manage to communicate my strong desire to have, a, have an espresso. And that works. So as a, as a means, uh, language works as a tool. But at the same time, rationality has become part of who I am. It is part of my dynamic contingent nodal point of, of my existence in the world. So it's no, that's a further implication. So it's no longer something in, in material, it's no longer its essence, which permanently remains the same, but each interaction, um, each further movement, everything alters who we are and thereby also alters the understanding of rationality. And, and and so it, it's so it's it's an, a revised understanding um, of of technology as just being a means, and it takes seriously the notion that technology or here rationality gets integrated in into the being in the world and the being, and that's that shows why the words are so or can be misleading because it's not a being, it's not an essence which I am, but it's a permanent becoming, it's a permanent modification. Each little moment directly alters who I am, alters my own rationality. And so, yes, rationality is a technology, but one shouldn't misunderstand technologies as by, by solely having means or a functional understanding of rationality in mind. And that also plays into probably the duality that we oftentimes draw between nature and culture. Technology is not necessarily something that stands apart from and stands even in opposition to our natural state. Exactly. And, and, and so, yes, this is part also of the revised understanding of who we are, that sort of our nature culture understanding is highly implausible. And, and this is something we, we've, we've inherited from, from a longstanding Platonic Christian tradition. Yeah, it goes back to the uh, Plato's cave where they highlighted sort of the, the distinction between the, the, the good as being uh, as being identical to the sun, to the immaterial sun, to rationality, and 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 sort of us being in the world of change us being in the darkness and sort of such a dualistic understanding is no longer plausible. And that needs to be taken into consideration when thinking about anthropology and ethics today. And thereby, by taking these problematic du dualities into consideration, um, it's also a way of moving away from all the types of discrimination which go along with these dualities. And it's, it's very good to demonstrate which problematic structures have come about as a consequence of these dualities. So just looking back to Plato's cave, we see here the sort of the sun as being rationality, as being the good in itself. So here, um, well, the sun is bright and we are in the darkness. So here we see Clark, brightness as being good, darkness as being as being bad. This is racism already being in the, you know, in our as being part of our encrusted structures of our of our cultures. Furthermore, we see rationality, rationality as being, you know, the sun being rationality, our bodies being being our emotionality being away from rationality. Um, rationality um, is tra traditionally being identified with man, the body's emotions with women. Here we see, here we see uh, um, sexism as being part of this longstanding cultural history. Furthermore, um, rationality is something which has traditionally been held only by human beings. Others, non-human beings, simply couldn't possess rationality. They were solely material entities. You can still find that in, in Descartes. You can still find that in, in Kant. You can still find this understanding in most foundational laws all over the world. It's only humans who are persons. Animals 
are things or are supposed to be treated like things? And that again goes back to this dualistic understanding where it's humans who possess rationality. All non-humans don't have that capacity. And so here we see all the great diversity of discriminatory structures, which is um, founded in our Western cultural background. And there are only very few thinkers who've managed to move beyond, who've, who've created a twist, uh, moving away uh, from these categorical dualities like Heraclitus, like Spinoza, like Nietzsche. And so by drawing upon their, their understandings, their ways of thinking and combining it with also with transhumanism, I'm, I'm developing a new and new philosophically enhanced version, also a philosophically proper philo philosophy of transhumanism, which is what I'm presenting in this book. Can you talk a little bit about the idea of transhumanism? Where does that idea come from? So um, we've got the word transhumanare actually can already be found in Dante's Inferno. However, uh, so it seems that he has actually coined the term. However, then that referred to some 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 immaterial alteration in some other world, and and it has nothing to nothing really to do with what transhumanism stands for in our in our days. Uh, transhumanism then as a as a concept was coined, coined in 1951 by Julian Huxley. And this is, he's actually presented an understanding of transhumanism, which is still plausible today. And he, he also coined the term of evolutionary humanism. So evolutionary humanism and transhumanism are closely related terms in a book, New Bottles for a New Wine from 1957. He actually, he used both of these terms. And um, there were other thinkers. A friend of his was Thierry de Chandeur, who also talked talked about transhumanizing. So it was in these circles um, where the term came up, and Julian Huxley was the one who actually properly coined it. Then afterwards, in the 70s and in the end of the end of the 80s, it really turned into a, into a proper movement. And FM 2030 and and Max Moore, Natasha Vita Moore, they were decisive and in, in formulating the term. In, in developing a contemporary understanding of transhumanism. Then it developed into a movement. And then at the beginning, around 2000, suddenly, there were, there were intellectuals like Jürgen Habermas, one of you know, the world-leading philosophers of our times. Um, and he was reacting to a presentation by Peter Sloterdijk, who, who, who gave a talk entitled Rules for the Human Zoo, in which she talked about, in, in which she talked about, well, post and transhumanism, in which we talked about the necessity to to de develop laws concerning genetic modification, and uh, and and Habermas suddenly replied to this, oh, these are all you know neo Nietzschean fantasies. They're new breeding fantasies relating to a fascist understanding. Um, and so this is where the entire debate concerning transhumanism within academic circles actually, um, uh, you know, started to take place. Then it, they, they started, it was, you know, more and more intellectuals started to take seriously transhumanism as a movement. But even in the beginning of the 2000s, it didn't really, it didn't really get dealt with properly in most academia. Most professors still don't know what it stand, the, the, the notion stands for. Um, then suddenly, in between 2010 and now, then it really became a mass phenomena. You know, people like Infer Dan Brown's Inferno, he actually talked about transhumanism. He mentioned World Transhumanist Association. He referred to FM 2030. The entire plot was a transhumanist plot. Transcendence, the movie with Johnny Depp, it was about mind uploading, one element of, of transhumanism. Then sort of the Big Bang Theory talked a lot about transhumanism. And it, it came up in lots of Netflix series, Altered Carbon, Black Mirror is just an amazing series. So here you find that really in the cultural cultural fear, more and more people talking about it. But actually, what is interesting is still they talk about the phenomena, but sort of still the notion of transhumanism is still not so well known among many educated people. Even those, even the, the richest man in the world, Elon Musk, he self-identifies as a transhumanist and many others in Silicon Valley. So this is a sort of a short summary 
a short history of, of transhumanism. And nowadays, but nowadays, as a consequence of all the, you know, in particular what's happening with AI, with Neuralink, brain-computer interfaces, with genome editing, now more and more people realize that all of this is rooted in the in a, in a completely, in a, in a post-human paradigm shift, in a new understanding of who we are and how we relate to the world. And that's opening up an enormous amount of possibilities. So how do you understand transhumanism? How would you define it? So transhumanism is about is about an affirmation of new technologies in order to move beyond our current limitation. That's all there is. Does that mean it is so just sufficient, you know, to being a transhuman, a posthuman, if you if you break the world record in 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 in, in high jumping? Well, not necessarily, because sort of the way it as it is defined, um, it is sort of we need to significantly move, move beyond our current limitations, and there are different notions of the posthuman. The most radical one is sort of the one which is being talked about in in Silicon Valley very often, uh, Kurzweil. Uh, and and Elon Musk um, deal with it, and so it's it's about mind uploading. It's about a continued existence somewhere on a hard drive. I'm I'm very hesitant. I don't regard that as. I don't think this will happen in the next decades. I don't regard any of the any pressing current issue as being related to this. However, it's it, it's sort of many people simply get extremely excited about it and fascinated and talk about it. And it's being dealt with in loads of Netflix series. So it, that's why it's, it's it, people get fascinated by it. But I don't think it, 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 it is connected to any really pressing current issue we need to be confronted with. And then there, there are other cases. And the, the, the other option would be sort of establishing brain computer interfaces um, and having the possibility of, of also breaking away from our current species, sort of the post-human as a member of a new species, as a further development, evolutionary development. And that's becoming much more likely. That's a, that's a much more realistic notion. And, and the third understanding of post-human, it's simply you still remain a human being, but you, you move um, significantly move beyond the capacities currently living human beings possess. So basically, if we possess the same smelling capacities as a shark, then we would definitely be post-human. And, and these are various elements of what the post-human can stand for. And within transhumanism, it, it, there's a heated debate, sort of what is supposed to be the proper understanding. But the decisive issue, all of the technological innovations are being addressed, which we are currently facing, and we need to find a solution for them. And so it's, it's it's really enables us to to have a debate on the ethics of emerging technologies on and and on a revised understanding of uh, who we are as human beings, um, meaning that we don't have an eternal natural essence, but we are part of the evolutionary world. There's only a gradual difference between us and other other non-human animals, and that has significant implications for how issues concerning norms and values um, should apply in this sector. So what are some of the contemporary technologies that we, that we already have right now that you might classify as transhumanist? I mean, um, the, the, the technologies we in transhumanist debates, all the great variety of technologies are being addressed, and sort of um, whatever helps us to to achieve the goal of moving beyond the limitations. That is a you know this is a praiseworthy. That's an important technology, and one could ask, yeah, why should we move beyond our current limitations? Well. Uh, because in the past we've realized that by doing so, we've signif we're significantly increasing the likelihood of us living a good life, and that's that's a basic motivation. We all want to live a good life, and by using these technologies, uh, we increase our likelihood of doing so. And this comes out best, I guess, with respect to health technologies. So. In the past 200, just looking back the past 200 years, we can see we've doubled our life expectancy all over the world. And that's just a wonderful achievement. And it's not just our life expectancy, it's actually our quality of life has increased significantly. Sort of, And that's why transhumanists prefer to talk about the importance of an increased 
health span rather than the importance of an increased lifespan. Because what we are interested in is, is not just living longer. We don't want to, you know, normally most people don't want to, you know, you know, stay in bed, unable to move for 80 years from the age of 80 to 160. That's not normally in most people's interest. But however, um, if one lives longer, one lives longer healthily, then that makes an enormous difference. And so the one thing most transhumanists can actually, um, or most transhumanists affirm is that an increased health span is indeed in some way relevant to our quality of life. You know, we all have different notions of what the good life is, and that's it's important. And the transhumanists do take into consideration that there's just a great diversity of different understandings of what the good life stands for. However, what most what most transhumanists agree upon is sort of an increased health span is what most people identify with an increased quality of life. And this is something which should be taken seriously. And any technology which basically enables us to have an increased health span uh, would be such a transhumanist technology. In the book, you mention silicon and carbon-based technologies. Can you give... Um, a little overview of some of those technologies that that we're seeing come into fruition now. Yeah, so I make the I make the distinction between a silicon-based transhumanism and a carbonate-based transhumanism, and so and many in, in in also in public media when transhumanism is talked about, they merely talk about a silicon-based transhumanism, and they often do so in order to make fun of transhumanism, uh, because sort of in particular sort of in academia, sort of if you talk about transhumanism, it's just about a bunch of young men who've been sitting in front of the computer for too long, and they just want to be turned into Superman on Viagra or Wonder Woman on Botox, and then uh, eventually get uploaded onto a hard drive and then become immortal in this manner. That's sort of the standard narrative in order to make fun of transhumanism um, by highlighting, you know, all transhumanists really ought to have that goal in mind, you know, getting uploaded into a hard drive. And, and this is sort of a silicon-based transhumanism is about putting putting your personality onto in, onto a hard drive and digitalizing your personality. And, and that could happen in different manners. I mean, you could actually um, it, it normally sort of one of the options is establishing a brain computer interface and then realizing some way of, of transferring the functions of your brain onto, onto a computer would be one way of realizing that upgrading process. There's possibility of maybe of copying your personality onto a hard drive. Another option is, uh, another option, we, we create a digital, a digital entity, a living digital entity, which then evolves further. And then thus comes about with maybe self-consciousness, with, with superintelligence and so on. So it's independent. It's just created, initially stimulated by, by humans. Um, all of these, all of these developments, I'm, I'm not excluding these possibilities of such, the possibilities of such developments. However, it's, it's, we don't even have any living digital entity. You know, so far, um, if we talk about, you know, in order for all of these developments to occur, the minimum we, we would need is to be alive and to be digital. And if you ask some people, even like Stephen Hawking, he said, we do actually have some living digital entities. And he said, a computer virus is a living digital entity. Uh, that doesn't really fulfill all the prerequisites of what we identify or what it means to being alive because it's self moving it's it's you know pass getting passing itself on from entity to entity via the internet however the virus um the virus cannot sustain itself um c cannot doesn't manage to get energy by itself. So, um, and thereby it lacks a significant element of what we identify with being alive. And the same applies to the, to the, to organic, to non, to non silicon based um, viruses either. So that's why a normal, like the COVID virus is also not a living entity. Um, so the same applies in, in, in both, both respects. The, the carbonate-based transhumanism, on the other hand, they are interested. So carbonate-based transhumanism is about moving beyond our current limitations as human beings. And maybe you still remain 
as a human being and 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 then but basically have the capacity you know of hearing significant perceiving infrared lights um smelling much better like sharks um but uh, or, or or having the possibility of suddenly having an increased health span by 30 more years this would be you know significant steps away maybe that would be sufficient also for for regarding another uh, us to being turned into another species if we then are unable to sexually procreate with other human beings uh, then that would count as a as a necessary as a criterion for them not no longer being regarded as human beings so it's about the the, the sexual uh, reproduction however um, once all of these possibilities come about it might sexual reproduction might not even be the most significant um, aspect for reproduction anymore because we're currently sort of disentangling um, sexuality from reproduction and we've been doing that for quite a while so that is that is also an important element of that carbonate based uh, transhumanism. So we started to deal with with condoms, with the pill, with with uh, in vitro fertilization, with and so on. Um, and now we we've already developed the bio bag, the bio bag for um, for 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 sheep for lamb. Uh, so it's it's like an artificial uterus um, and we've managed to realize that already so that a lamb can be born in such an artificial uterus and various scientists all over the world are working on a possibility on of of realizing such an artificial uterus for for human beings in netherlands they've been investing a lot of money in order to actually bring that about and so that would be a possibility so on the one hand sex being for entertainment and and technology is being used for reproduction productive purposes. Um, so that would make an enormous difference. Maybe it also could be a way of supporting uh, gender equality in the workplace. Whatever, you know, it shouldn't be necessary, but maybe it helps by by then there not being a need um, for, for getting pregnant anymore. It might even be safer for the child being stored in a, in a, in a, in a safer environment. So we will see. This is all, you know, this is but these are things we're already working on and we've made we've really we've already established and they work with lamps so when carbonate based transhumanists talk about issues it's all about stuff where here we can see uh, 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 here we can see examples which already work so it's not about pure science fiction it's actually we we've got a good indication that something works in other species it's just a matter of transferring the same technologies onto humans i know for example a couple of scientists in the netherlands who've who've, who've created a genetically a genetically engineered zebra fishes and these zebra fishes have the possibility of of photosynthesis so so um, they they managed to get 20% of their en energy by by means of the sunlight. As a consequence, they turn green. So you've got green solar power powered zebra fishes. That's that's a really fascinating technology. So uh, if if we manage to achieve that on on humans, no one would have to die of hunger anymore. Or if we fly to to Mars to another planet. You know the entire the question of how to deal with nutritional issues would be solved anyway so here we can see examples this is working on fishes we we, we simply we, obviously that's not so easy but you know then but there's a there's a good chance that the same procedure also works on human beings and these would be examples of technologies concerning a carbonate based transhumanism um, in particular related to gene technologies crispr cas9 um, and there, there's such an enormous potential which goes along with that specific technology um, which could enable us to to live much longer and better and healthier and and that's why i think this is sort of this carbonate based transhumanism is something which i'm strongly supporting and i think is something which we should take seriously also politically because most people in and most people identify a longer life, a longer and healthier life with a better quality of life, no matter what they what else they identify with the good life. But living longer and healthier is the one thing which is important to most people. So I was really intrigued by um, your talk about gene modification in the book. One question that I had is, is I it doesn't seem to me that the problem or the the 
tension with these technologies is that they're unnatural. I I, I totally agree with you that within uh, a cyborgian understanding of the history of humanity, technology is not. It's the the concern with it doesn't have to be that they're unnatural. But my my question is, I'm wondering if they'll actually have the opposite problem, maybe which is that they'll serve to reinforce ideas about what is naturally good. For example, if you can select to have a higher IQ, to be faster, to be stronger, to live longer, won't those traits, having a higher IQ, even like being skinnier or something, if, if parents can select, for that, select that for their offspring, won't those traits be even further reinforced as the ones that are desirable if the socioeconomically elite are the ones that are selecting for them? Won't those traits be further codified as this is the good? And if if those technologies are only available to the socioeconomically elite, because technologies are always expensive, I would assume that only those who can afford them are going to be able to get them. Won't that just continue to create a a, a further chasm between the haves and have nots? Yeah, you're right with your very. I think this is one of the significant challenges, um, but it's also one which is taken care of or which is being discussed intensely within the transhumanist circles. So uh, it, it would be false to solely identify uh, transhumanism with these libertarian Silicon Valley transhumanists who are just interested in, who just focus on freedom. And that would lead to a hierarchy in the world, which exactly um, a vision which you have in mind, which you've just presented. And that would be extremely dangerous. And I, I perfectly agree with you because it would probably have the consequences you, you're mentioning, because in that case, um, it, it, it does undermine a central achievement of the enlightenment process, namely freedom. So if we just focus on freedom, then 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 we end up with a hierarchy of the haves and have-nots, um, which undermines, which takes away the freedom of the have-nots, because they are implicitly forced, or maybe even explicitly forced, to do something they don't want to do. And that's why a, a libertarian version is 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 not a proper understanding of freedom. A proper understanding of freedom needs to take into consideration that a, a, a too strong hierarchy undermines freedom itself, and then other elements need to come need to become relevant. For example, the element that in order to to be free, you also need to be healthy. Being healthy is 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 you know, a prerequisite for, for the achievement of freedom. And as a consequence of that, you, you would need a universal, universal health insurance. Um, and that's something which is an issue in the United States. I think that's one of the most challenging elements of, of living in the United States, that because that there is no, no uh, universal health insurance. And, and, and that is actually not, as, as, I, as I stress, that is, is it, it undermines a proper understanding of freedom. And, and so um, any such state which takes this understand uh, fr- freedom seriously would have to make sure health is being covered. And then you need to deal with what actually does that imply. And there are many different, many different notions um, of health. And, and it always depends on the financing um, concerning how good your health insurances are. And even though here in in Europe we have, uh, you know, there is a universal health insurance in the European Union in all the countries of the European Union, but obviously there's an enormous difference between what the health insurance in in Germany offers um, to the health insurance in Italy and again to the health insurance in Bulgaria because it depends on the financial background. Um, So we need to make sure that sort of a health insurance, a decent health insurance is actually financed and supported by by a liberal, demo, social liberal democratic government. And and it's an issue even in, you know, in, in a country like Italy and, and Bulgaria, where we do have a national health insurance. There are certain surgeries um, which are not which are only offered in private practices in Italy, which are being covered. And as part of the public health insurance in Germany, just to give, you know, this is 
just one example that, that this that this is a case and that's a challenge and that's why and i think that's uh, we need, money is needed in order to finance these public health insurance and the question is where do we get the money from and sort of as as part of the book i made the suggestion that we do need to use our digital data in order to finance in order to finance the public health insurance system and that we shouldn't give away the digital data to the big companies, um, to the big digital players, companies, to, to Google and, and, and Facebook, because they're just using it for their own interests, for their own, you know, that the CEO and administrators get richer and richer. Um, and we shouldn't give it sort of to China um, or to any type of more authoritarian structure either, because they're just using it to uphold their own political structures. So we need to find a proper liberal, social liberal democratic way of using personalized digital data democratically. And that is not so easy, but we need to use the data. And the problem is, Europe is currently focusing on, on protecting privacy. And I understand, I fully understand the value of privacy. And I'm, I'm extremely scared of giving up, of moving away from, from, from these structures, from, from cherishing privacy. However, given the relevance of personalized digital data, I think there is a practical necessity to do so. And in the end, uh, that's why in the book I d suggested a, a structure how we can achieve a system, a liberal democratic system, where the personalized digital, digital data are being collected by a liberal government. Because I have, in the end, the question is, so we need personalized digital data because data is the new oil as is widely being shared in by economists. We need the data for our health purposes, for policy making, for innovation, in all the, for research in the social sciences, in the, in the, new, uh, in the natural sciences. It's, it's enormously, it's normally, it's enormously important. So the way digital data are being treated in, in Europe is not in the European interest. If we continue to do so, um, it will be, we will not be able to uphold the social insurance system which we currently have in, in Europe because the money simply goes away to countries who, who make use of the personalized digital data. So we need to find a way of an institution collecting the data and using it in, in a democratic interest. And the question is, what is a democratic interest? And the democratic interest on the basis of a liberal understanding that where each one of us has a different understanding of the good life, well, we focus on, on what is being shared by most people. And most people identify an increased health span with a better quality of life. So by giving the way the data, personalized digital data, away to such an institution, a political institution, um, and using it then in order to finance the public health insurance is sort of my suggestion of finding an alternative in between the libertarian U.S. American version and, and the authoritarian Chinese version. Obviously, much more would have to be said, but that is sort of the basic logic um, which I'm presenting as part of the book. This is a way sort of because health is, 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 is a fundamental element for, for of freedom, and freedom is not just absence of constraint. There's more to it. There's health. There's also social justice. A certain type of equality is important, and um, so we need to find a different way of realizing it. So, th th so my response, the, the important response is: well, there is a problem. Um, if we, ch it's but it's a political problem. It's got to do with the libertarian structures and not with transhumanism. It's got to do with the political circumstances. And I'm presenting, I'm outlining a sketch of some political circumstances where we could benefit of the developments of emerging technologies, but such that they're in a democratic interest. I think that is a perfect response. Um, so, Stefan, we are running out of time now on, on our meeting. I would just like to ask you before we go, you you have so much, you have so many interesting thoughts and ideas can is there any anything else that people can read that you've written recently or that that is about to come out so i've got a 
general introduction on transhumanism, which, which came out with Penn State University Press in 2020, that was translated from the German. Then in 2022, yeah, the We've Always Been Cyborgs, in which I sort of deal with all the ethics and the philosophy of transhumanism. And then a couple of months later, the book came out, Philosophy of Posthuman Art, in which I address all the implications concerning imagining technologies on the field of the arts. And that's coming out as a paperback in, on, in September. That's already been out as a hardback, but in September it will be out as a cheap paperback. Um, philosophy of posthuman art, it gives an additional aspect. I completely talk, you know, solely the field of arts and, and the connections also to religion, technology, the arts, and so that might be of interest to some who enjoy that book. <laughs> well, I'm excited to read it. And maybe, well, just one further thing is in 2017, I established the world's first journal explicitly dedicated to the posthuman. So because normally the response was in academic circles, when I talked about transhumanism and posthumanism and metahumanism, and then the response, well, does, is there any academic journal? Because if there's no academic journal, it's not a praiseworthy, it's not an academic enterprise. So it took us about four years in order to get it done because it's a long, it's not just a simple peer review process for getting an article published, but actually, you know, you have a, you establish a new field of studies. Post-human studies didn't exist before. So, you know, so, so we established the Journal of Post-Human Studies in cooperation with Penn State University Press. It was launched in 2017 in the editorial board. You find leading representatives from both the critical post-humanists, from the transhumanist side, from, from Karen Barat, Catherine Hales, K Julian Savolescu. You find artists like Kach and Stellark. Um, you find ethicists like Luciano Floridi, Julian Savolescu. You find philosophers Gianni Vattimo, Wolfgang Wersch. It's an enormous range of really illustrious intellectuals uh, who supported that project, all the leading authorities in the field. And so we've got, we've and, and that's a double client peer review journal. It, it, it is listed in Scopus. It, you know, it's, it's progressing ac as an academic field. And it's available um, online as well as in print. And as a consequence of that journal, and now we took it one step further, I'm offering a course on post-human studies at John Cabot University. And in cooperation with Eva University, we're trying to establish post-human studies further in academia. So at Eva, at Eva Women's University in Seoul, which is one of the best universities in South Korea, they are now offering an MA and PhD program dedicated to post-human studies. So if you want to write a doctoral thesis dedicated to uh, the episode No Stive in, in, the, in, in the Black Mirror, in Black Mirror and how it relates to the Chinese social credit system, you can do so as part of that uh, PhD program at Eva University. So we see it's really developing. It's uh, enormously fascinating and thrilling to be part of such a, of such a cultural movement of the post-human paradigm shift moving away from these dualistic um, uh, discriminatory structures of the past. Thank you so much, Stefan. Thanks a lot for your wonderful interview.